Good evening and welcome to Kini News. Here are today's top stories. Rosma Mansour, she was supposed to be in court today, but she was nowhere near it because she's actually still in Singapore. Rosma Mansour has not returned from Singapore to attend her Court of Appeal hearing. This is despite the High Court having issued an order for her to return on or before the 21st of November. Prosecutor Gopal Sri Ram asked the appeals court judges to issue an arrest warrant. However, the court made a unanimous decision to withhold the warrant after hearing from Rosma's lawyer Jagjit Singh. Jagjit told the court that it was an oversight and he takes full responsibility for her absence. Another of Rosma's counsels, Akberdin Abdul Kadir, told Malaysia Kini that the court had actually excused her attendance today through a letter to them. He said what was important is that she must return her passport on or before the 6th of December. He added that she will be in court on Monday, December 6th at 9am without fail. Akberdin clarified that while Rosma was originally due to return by the 21st of November, she decided to return later due to the introduction of the vaccinated travel lane. According to him, this is because there is no quarantine needed as announced by the government and not deliberately done. Zeti's alleged links to Jolo and 1MDB-linked funds have given Najib's defence team new hope. In less than a week's time, the Court of Appeal will deliver its verdict on Najib Abdul Razak's appeal in the 42 million ringgit SRC International Graft case. Now, the former Prime Minister is seeking to tender new evidence to support his defence through a notice of motion. In an affidavit, Najib explained that he sought the adducting of new evidence following the revelation by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission that Singapore had repatriated to Malaysia 15.4 million US dollars in 1MDB-linked funds. The funds involved a company co-owned by Taufik Ayman, the husband of former Bank Negara Governor Zeti Akhtar Aziz. Najib claimed that the evidence was not available during the SRC criminal trial before the Kuala Lumpur High Court and that the new evidence is, quote, materially relevant to the issues linked to the case. In a press conference this afternoon, Najib's lead defence counsel, Mohammad Shafi Abdullah, said the defence team was not aware that the former Bank Negara Governor Zeti Akhtar Aziz was under investigation. This evidence that we have now got is credible because three, four, Credible people have confirmed it in Parliament, outside Parliament, and the NACC has confirmed it. So now, this is important for our client, and we want this extra evidence, the new evidence, to be adduced at the uh, appeal in the SRC, because the SRC decision has not been given. So it is still within time for the Court of Appeal to consider reopening so that we can put in this evidence, because this evidence, I will tell you in a short while, while it, why it is so critical. During the press conference, Shafi was also asked why the defence did not accept the prosecution's offer for Zeti to take the stand during Najib's graft trial involving SRC International. The answer is very simple. When Zeti was offered to us, you know, we don't have Zeti's statement. We do not know what Zeti said. So the rule of the defence, the rule of the game of a good defence counsel is you don't call a witness who you do not know what she, he or she is going to say. But if we had known that she and her family received substantial amount of money from Jolo, I would have made an application under section 425 of the uh, criminal procedure code to ask the court to call her so that as a court witness I can cross-examine. The Court of Appeal has fixed the 8th of December to deliver its decision on Najib's appeal to quash the High Court's guilty verdict, as well as the 12-year jail term and 210 million ringgit fine in the SRC corruption case. Most people working in Kuala Lumpur will be off tomorrow on Friday unless you're working in the banking sector, which is actually good news because then economic activity can continue. Federal Territories Minister Shahidan Kasim yesterday declared that all three federal territories of Kuala Lumpur, Labuan and Putrajaya will get an extra public holiday on Friday. However, Bank Nagara and all banks in Kuala Lumpur, including branch operations, will remain open tomorrow. Bank Nagara said all financial market transactions in foreign exchange, money and over-the-counter bond markets will continue to function as usual. Shahidan declared the holiday to celebrate the Kuala Lumpur City's football team's Malaysia Cup victory. The impromptu holiday, however, was met with mixed reactions. Infectious diseases expert Dr. Adiba Kamarul Zaman lamented that the holiday had affected the schedule of medical personnel exams, which had already been affected by COVID-19 and the resultant lockdowns. Meanwhile, Bangi MP Ong Kian Ming said Shahidan's move was populist and politically irresponsible. He said as Kuala Lumpur is the hub of financial services, a sudden holiday could trigger millions in unplanned lost output. 
The holiday declaration wasn't good news for everyone though and it had mixed reactions. Some questioned if the minister put any thought into it. So how much thought did he actually put into it? Well, for starters, let's say it won't be a paid holiday. City folks rejoiced as the government announced a public holiday in Kuala Lumpur, Putrajaya and Labuan for Friday. However, they may want to read the fine print. The holiday is not a paid holiday covered by the Employment Act. Because of this, Human Resources Minister M. Saravanan is encouraging employers in the three federal territories to give their workers a paid holiday anyway. He said this in a brief statement, noting that Friday's holiday is not covered by the Employment Act. The Employment Act states that employees are entitled to a paid holiday on 11 gazetted public holidays in a single calendar year. Section 60D subsection B does state that workers can get a paid holiday under any holiday declared as per Section 8 of the Holidays Act. Unfortunately, Friday's holiday was declared by Federal Territories Minister Shahidan Kasim using Section 9 subsection 2 of the Holidays Act, meaning that it is not covered as a paid holiday for workers. And now a message from our sponsor and when we're back, find out why Selangor Amno still just does not want to give up on pass. See you after the break. Shellfish, red meat and beer. If you love indulging in these foods, you may end up with high uric acid level in your blood. These foods consist high level of purine, a substance that will eventually break down into uric acid and be excreted through our urine. It is recommended that the amount of dietary purines should be kept between 600 to 1000 mg per day. Having too much uric acid in your blood can cause attacks of gout. It can also cause kidney stones and blockage in the kidney. The crystallization of the excessive uric acid in your blood can be eased by reducing purine-rich food to only 100 to 150 mg daily, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, and consuming urinary alkalinizer like Ural. It consists of sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, and sodium citrate that increases the urinary pH and solubility of uric acid to prevent crystallization. Best of all, it's lemon-flavored and sugar-free. Ural, effective urinary alkalinizer. Neutralize your uric acid problem now. Welcome back. The Amno Pass marriage may be over in most of the country, except in Selangor. Selangor BN Chairperson No Omar said it will be hard for the coalition to reclaim power in the state if it still clashes with PAS. No said the three-cornered fight in the previous general election was among the reasons Barisan National was defeated. Speaking to Free Malaysia today, he said the best way is Muafakat National. The 2018 general election saw Harapan securing state power for the third time by winning 51 out of the 56 state seats. BN won only four, while PAS, which contested in 42 seats, won only one. No said the matter had been brought to party president Ahmad Zaid Hamidi and had appealed to past president Abdul Hadi Awang to ensure both parties will not clash in Selangor. No also did not dismiss the possibility of cooperating with Bersatu and Perikatan Nasional as Azmin Ali and Zoraida Kamarudin were no longer part of Harapan. If you are a young Malaysian looking forward to voting for the very first time in the upcoming Sarawak state elections, well, you better hope you are 21 years old and above. Malaysians aged 18 to 20 years old will not be allowed to vote in the upcoming Sarawak state election. This was confirmed by de facto law minister Wan Junaidi Tonku Jafar. This is despite the Undi 18 constitutional amendments to lower the voting age and implement automatic voter registration that will kick in on December 15th, three days before the polling day in Sarawak. In a statement, Wan Junaidi explained that for the state election, the election commission will use the electoral roll that was updated on the 2nd of November. He said this decision is based on the legal process, including the decision made by the Kuching High Court and is not meant to deny or sidestep the rights and desires of young voters. He also said he hoped that this issue will not be politicized. Wan Junaidi is a member of Gabungan Party Sarawak, which is the incumbent Sarawak state government. The Sarawak election was supposed to be held in the middle of this year but was postponed due to COVID-19 after a localized emergency was declared in the state. After months and months of discussions, the Selangor state government and the federal government are finally on the same page for the East Coast Rail Link alignment through the state. 
the Selangor portion of the East Coast Rail Link will go with its proposed northern alignment. Previously, the state government preferred the southern alignment, which transverses through Hululangat, Kuala Langat, Bangi and Putrajaya before the Port Klang terminus. The Selangor state government has finally given its nod to the proposed northern alignment, which will begin in Gombak and run through Surinda, Punchak Alam and Kapar before ending in Port Klang. After 37 meetings, including more than 17 and 12 uh, institution, both state and uh, and, and federal uh, agencies, finally we come into one conclusion that we accept the North alignment. And I hope with this uh, decision made by the state, we'll uh, uh, make sure that the project is smooth and we can achieve the target to make sure that uh, the connectivity between the east and uh, the west area of Selangor and uh, of Malaysia have been, been conducted and, 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 and can contribute the economic uh, spur of the economic activity. The ECRL press conference and document handover ceremony for Section C Northern Alignment event held today was also attended by Transport Minister Wee Ka Siong. Wee thanked the Selangor government for helping the Transport Ministry resolve the issue after talks held over 18 months. Good news for gig economy workers, they may soon have a wider safety net with the amendment of the Employment Act. The Employment Act will be amended to include definitions for employee and employer in an effort to clarify work relationships such as in the gig economy. This was revealed by Human Resources Deputy Minister Awang Hashim in Parliament today. Pindahan ini adalah salah satu usaha kerajaan untuk memperjelaskan hubungan pekerjaan pada masa hadapan seperti dalam ekonomi gig. Ini kerana Pada masa sekarang terdapat lakuna ataupun bahasa undang-undang lakuna ataupun bahasa kita jurang. Terutamanya dalam menentukan kategori kontrak sama ada kontrak perkhidmatan ataupun kontrak of service ataupun kontrak untuk perkhidmatan, kontrak for service. The Employment Act currently does not cover workers involved in contracts for service which is the case in the pea hailing sector. While the government is in the process of amending the Act, Awang said they have prepared a social security network for pea hailing workers under the Self-Employment Social Security Scheme which is enforced by Perkeso. Starting on the 1st of October this year, all employees in this sector are mandated to register and contribute under the Self-Employment Social Security Act. The Deputy Minister said that this is a way to ensure that this group of employees has some form of social security as they have a high risk of work accidents. That's a wrap for Kini News today. For more stories, go to kinitv.com. Don't forget to follow us on our social media on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook to get the latest news headlines. If you'd like to support the independent media, please do consider a subscription to malaysiakini.com. When you're heading out, don't forget your mask. And when you can, please try to stay home. I'm Daniel Anthony. Thank you for watching. And as always, stay safe, Malaysia. Everyone wants to see these scenes bigger. That's why we've got bigger TVs for everyone to enjoy them bigger. Watch colors come to life on a large screen. LG Nanocell.